Welcome back to another episode of Talent Talk. Whatever your listening preference, you can find our feature interviews on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, and of course on UNFOspreys.com. Don't miss our chats with student athletes, coaches, alumni, and Ospreys and the pros. Now, let's get to today's episode. Welcome back. It's uh, edition number 53 of Talent Talk. Today we have on UNF baseball player, uh, first baseman, catcher, and uh, graduate student, uh, Alex Cashler. Thanks for joining. Yeah, thank you for having me. So I've been meaning to get you on for a while, and thankfully you've continued to produce, and it's good timing for us to do this interview. You're hitting well above three, uh, 300 all year, um, the mid-300s, as a matter of fact. Uh, give an introduction of yourself, person, student athlete, baseball player, kind of however you want to describe yourself. Um, yeah, so I'm a graduate transfer from Division Three Methodist University. It's in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and, but I'm a, uh, I'm a Florida boy. I've lived in Florida for pretty much my whole life now, and I grew up in Tampa, Florida. Um, in the classroom, indust- I was an industrial engineering major at Methodist, and I received my degree from there. And then now I'm pursuing a master's in business management here at North Florida. So a couple of questions can stem from that for sure. Uh, we'll start with the academics. Um, going in engineering undergrad and then management graduate student, um, you do see some of that combination sometime, but is there a specific reason for kind of, you know, not doing a grad degree in engineering, but doing a more business focused degree? Uh, mostly just for, for versatility purposes, just to be able to be uh, hireable in several different fields and potentially maybe making any promotions a little easier to get with a management background. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good move for sure. I mean, engineering is definitely a a versatile degree in itself, but, you know, I was always curious. I saw that in your, in your major and wondered that maybe, you know, you wanted an administrative side or ability within engineering field, but um, academically you succeeded undergrad, got a COSIDA honor, which is um, as SIDs know, um, it's, a uh, combination of academics and athletics. And then recently we're recognized as a nominee for the senior class award, which also combines both of them. So props to you for doing that. It is definitely a grind being a baseball player in college because, you know, <laughs> those seasons, especially in D1, a typical one can be up to 60 games. And that's a lot of, tri- that's a lot of studying on the road. <laughs> yeah. A lot of laptops propped up on the bus and it's hard to find a charger. Sometimes your seat doesn't have a plug. So you got to use the one behind you, yeah. you know, that whole thing. Um, any keys and tricks to the trade to uh, keeping your studies in order on the road? Uh, I mean, just gotta, just gotta find time. If it's a, if it's a three hour bus ride, it's gotta get done. So, I mean, it's if it's uncomfortable it's just it's just part of part of what we signed up for (laughs) yeah you've got you know food everywhere around you bottles rolling around at your feet but you got to stay focused and put those headphones in somehow (laughs) that's definitely the that's definitely the way to go um you know for you success on the baseball field getting to to playing is no surprise i mean it's you had some great numbers in division three probably some of the best that played at methodist which is a very good division three program for those that don't know um how have you been able to continue producing this year, despite the change from B3 to D1? Um, I'd say just uh, just coming, showing up prepared, ready to go. Um, I'm always looking for ways to improve improve my game. And so whether it's uh, working on some new, new or hitting philosophies, trying out some new stuff, uh, trying new stuff with my catching, I'm always trying to look for that next way to get a little bit better. And then also, I'd say the biggest one is just being honest when I evaluate myself. Like if I'm doing something that I know might expose me a little further down the road, it's a little better to address it now than when I actually get exposed. So uh, really just one of the big things I was trying to cut down on some movements in my swing because I knew I'd be facing some better uh, velocity this season. So Mm -hmm. that was just one example of kind of just trying to stay ahead of the curve, trying to uh, trying to or fix things before they become a big issue in the future. Yeah, I mean, that's always the thing is, as a baseball player, whether you're a pitcher or a hitter, um, there are so many different ways to improve and so many philosophies to implement. Um, for you in particular, as a hitter, do you kind of see a certain philosophy as one that you try to follow? I mean, there's always different ones. You know, obviously the Ted Williams, you got to swing with a little bit of an uppercut. You know, yeah. you're going to have a better opportunity to hit or the the 
the, the batters that guess on pitches that go about yeah. it doing it that way? Is there one that you kind of go for? I mean, without tipping what you do, because obviously I don't want to make it public knowledge too much. <laughs> well, no, it's funny. Actually, I read Ted Williams' book uh, over quarantine. And his, okay. uh, called The Science of Hitting. So mm-hmm. that was one of the books I read. But um, I really just like having uh, – I like having the numbers here. So I know having um, – I know having – uh, having access to a scouting report that might say how often people throw certain pitches, stuff like that. So it's more just uh, applying some of the information they give us. And it's nice at the division one level, there's like a, there's a little bit more of that information here. So <laughs> and we, we know a little bit about the pitcher going in rather than just right hand or a left hander. <laughs> yeah. That was one of the things that struck me and we, you know, I could get into the weeds for a long time about this stuff yeah. in particular for another day. Um, but that's one of the big differences is the scouting report, you know, because at the division three level, a lot of times coaches, you might not have a full coaching staff um, or somebody is splitting duties. I know for me, for example, my, you know, the outfielder coach, not that I was an outfielder, but the outfielder coach and one of the base coaches, he was also our head athletic trainer, you know? Yeah. So it's, you know, I mean, it's harder to have a scouting report when you already have those jobs, but it is a difference. Do you, have you found that when you got the division one that you really delve in each week to those numbers? Is that something you kind of set up a routine for yourself each week to, to break down who you're facing? Um, I don't really like to do it super far ahead of time just because I might get, might start thinking like, oh man, like I, might, I just might start overthinking about stuff like that. So I really like when I show up to the field, I like to kind of glance over it, see and so it's really just that day, like in that day of preparation. And then maybe if we're playing a, uh, like, for example, like we're playing JU this weekend, we know Friday we'll get a right-handed pitcher who has a good slider. So mm-hmm. might go on the uh, pitching machine and put it on sliders. Mm-hmm. So more like that. Yeah, that's, that's fair. I mean, you don't want to psych yourself out too much and there's yeah. always information overload at the same time. So oh. I'm sure it's a, <laughs> it's a measured balance uh, for sure. So, Speaking of your transition again to Division One, you, you know, it was straight into the frying pan. Um, I mean, there was really no time to, you know, acclimate. You're playing Florida State and you were starting. What was going through your mind at that point? Um, how did you mentally prepare for that? Um, you know, I was really just, I was really excited to get going. Of course, first game, there's always going to be some jitters, so. Uh, I knew that it, regardless of who I was playing. So mm-hmm. uh, it almost made it really – it almost made it better. We were playing a really good team to start out with, and I'm also facing a good arm. So I just uh, knew I had to go out there and stick to my game. Uh, it was nice that I was really facing, like, the upper echelon of D1 baseball. <laughs> right like that. So it really uh, – especially coming out and performing well, it was definitely a big confidence booster. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, you got player of the week right off the bat. Wasted no time getting uh, that those accolades at 700 at FSU. You obviously, got that that win, and you're facing you know Carson Montgomery right away. He was throwing throwing heat. Um, had there ever been an environment that you had felt you know has there would was there ever an environment like playing at Florida State at Division three that you could even equate to you know? Not at Division three. Uh, there really were a lot of those games are mostly just parents or not yep. they don't on a ton of fans, but I did play in the uh, coastal plain league one summer. So we got to go down to the Savannah bananas. Mm-hmm. So that was, that was probably the closest thing I experienced to that. Yeah. The, those summer ball leagues, whether it's Cape, whether it's the Northwoods, uh, whether it's coastal um, you get a few with the mink league. I mean, all over the, those can bring it a little bit. You can get yeah. some jumping environments for sure, especially, you know, how the summer is people want to come out and have a good time and, yeah. you know, they're, they're heckling you in the stands. Uh, you know, those aren't to be glossed over, but as you said, um, division three baseball, it's a lot of time it's cold middle of the day afternoons mm-hmm. in the midweek. And it's just parents or, you know, a smattering of students. there, really under a hundred people. So I did ask that because I mean, there probably wasn't one that compared to playing Florida yeah. state, you know, that, that, that was a, uh, a new opportunity for you and a new thing to check off. Um, cycling back a little bit. I remember talking to coach Parenton in the summer and he was mentioning your name and kind of how, um, you know, you were coming to UNF and, you know, I looked you up at that point and was curious seeing it was going to be a division three player. Uh, why UNF, you know, how did that come about? 
um, how did you target North Florida? Um, well, once, um, once we got an extra year of eligibility, I really wanted, I knew I wanted to play again and I knew I'd want to play at a, uh, hopefully a new school just because uh, Methodist didn't really have many uh, graduate opportunities. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to go somewhere that I could get a master's degree and also play some baseball. So I looked for schools mostly in the Southeast. And since I was from Florida, preferably Florida and UNF turned out to be a really good fit. Uh, my parents have been able to make trips to a lot of games. So it's really just been mostly location. And then also just quality of the program, really all just a really good combination for me, quality of the program in school. So um, obviously you don't think this year would have happened unless COVID would have occurred. It would have been the completion of your collegiate career if COVID didn't mm -hmm. happen. So looking back at it, uh, when you're about to graduate before COVID hit in early March of 2020, you know, were there aspirations to play college or to play baseball after college? Or, you know, was that not really even a thought you were just going to go on with your life? Uh, no, I was, I was looking at playing professional baseball. Um, I talked to a few teams at, when I was at Methodist. So I was really, um, I wasn't playing super well when our season got cut off. So there was like some stresses about that. And then, once the draft got uh, moved down to four or from 40 to five rounds, I knew there was absolutely no shot. So yeah, and just being upset or anything pouting, I just, I was like, all right, I'm just, I got to go play somewhere. I got to make this happen fast. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and that's the thing about playing division three too. And I'm sure you could elaborate on it is, you know, every year there are draftees into, you know, from division three baseball, but even with, you know, as many rounds as there are, there's only, you know, there's probably under five, I would yeah. say every year. And it's predominantly JUCO, it's predominantly division one. So it's very difficult. And I'm sure that that weighed a little bit on your mind, you know. So in a way, this year has been a new birth. Um, so when you did find out you had the opportunity here at North Florida, uh, was there anybody you talked to? Was there any kind of advice that you got or any type of way that you specifically prepared for taking the division one step? Um. I'd say the biggest way I prepared. So a lot, I have, I do have some friends in professional baseball and pretty much all of them are pitchers. So <laughs> I spent pretty much the whole summer catching them and then hitting off them twice a week. So it really was a good introduction to faster pitching, uh, maybe some different pitch calling than what I was used to stuff like that. So hitting off those guys and maybe getting, getting exposed a little bit, striking out a little bit more than I was used to <laughs> probably good for me to, adapt to some better pitching <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it, it probably did help your cause a little bit catching them as well you know you can get yeah. you get to see them twice as much you know yeah. before you get up and, and take some swings what has been the biggest adjustment for you um in the transition whether it's on or off the field um i'd say the biggest adjustment is just expectations there's like um in division three there was pretty uh pretty big variability in the quality of teams so yeah. here i'd say everyone everyone's good like everyone can beat you on any given day and that, that was the case in division three there were some upsets but there were some games where we'd show up to the field and we'd expect to win pretty big and i can't say that's really ever been the case here where we ever showed up to the field expecting to beat someone down 18 nothing so yeah I'd say it was just there's less time to take pitches off. There's less time to take games off because there's really just somebody will jump all over you here and you'll lose your spot. You'll lose, you lose the game. Like there's any just case you got to be ready to go. <laughs> That's the thing about D1 baseball is a lot of people that aren't familiar with it. They don't know the parody of it. I mean, you know, at any given day, a top 25 team can get beat in the midweek. Um, they can get beat on, you know, if there are is a weekend series uh, and you typically at division one, you get those same teams every single year. Uh, were there some, some teams in D uh, division three that you really remember playing that, that brought it every time? Oh, there's some good rivalry memories back then. Yeah, there were some, we played in a good conference. Uh, we always saw some really good teams. I know my freshman year, there was a La LaGrange from Georgia, mm -hmm. LaGrange college. They came out and they were hitting, I think they hit. 12 home runs in a three game series which in division three is like almost unheard of yeah i think at this point they might have been ranked number one in the country they were one or two okay and they came out and smoked us three games and that was probably one of the best division three teams i've ever saw and i've never really i don't think i've ever seen a team like that that could hit like that 
it was it was pretty crazy but so they were always good um we always would play piedmont they were always a good team mm-hmm. and then in the conference tournament uh we'd end up playing huntington college was always good just they were always everyone was always solid in our conference so there were always some good battles once we got into conference games yeah, there are a number of good ones in your area or in the area that you played collegiate baseball. And then, you know, throughout the country, I mean, teams like, you know, Marietta was really dominant for a while and they're in Ohio. And then, you know, St. Thomas is in Minnesota and they're very good. And sometimes you do get a little bit of at those schools, the benefit of large Big Ten schools that transfer, you know, have transfers out that want to still play. And that does occur. But, you know, all over the country, there's there's good talent, uh, even up in Northeast. And you do make those trips to Arizona and Florida in the middle or in the early, <laughs> early yeah. year to get some of those games in for sure. Um, before we talk a little bit more about, you know, playing here, uh, is there something about Division three being a D3 athlete uh, that you don't think people are aware of? Um, I just say that in baseball, there, re- there really are some good players. So, yeah, I mean, like you said, there are, there's division three players that get drafted every year. And then also just people, people end up growing a lot when they get to college, they end up becoming better players. So the guy might've been written off throwing a pitcher, maybe he's throwing 82, 83 in high school. By the end of his division three career, he might be throwing 93. (laughs) Nobody's ever a finished product when they show up there. So you can, you can continue to improve, you can continue to get better. So I think that's the case for a lot of really good division three players is they, they show up there they put in the work for four years and really turn into really good players by the end of it. Well, speaking about yourself then, how much did you change, you know, over the course of your time at Methodist, was there that big change and, you know, how did you end up at Methodist to begin with? Um, I ended up at Methodist just cause they really, they really were a good fit for me. I knew I'd be able to go there and work, work hard from the get go. And I did change a lot. I started out, I came in as a pitcher first baseman. Okay. Played the, played first base my whole freshman year. And then one of the last weeks of the year, our second catcher broke his leg. <laughs> and then I moved to catcher because I caught, <laughs> a little, I caught a little bit in high school. So then I ended up catching with the last weekend or two. And then that summer in my exit meeting, coach was like, you should learn how to catch. And then next year I came back and then that's when, really my career took off as a player uh I gained a lot of weight in the muscle weight in the weight room so I came back about 20 pounds heavier all muscle just felt really good felt really confident and from then on it was I just felt like a different player yeah it's funny how that catching situation works out sometimes it's also the most willing person yeah (laughs) that ends up getting stuck with that depending on the team of course you know but obviously you did have a knack for it but some in some of those cases it's it's kind of the most uh uh willing and unafraid to get hurt body on the team (laughs) because you do get some nicks and cuts when you're playing (laughs) you're catching i don't care if there's no collisions at the plate or not many block balls you're still getting foul balls you're still getting you know down in the crouch every time and and everything in between um but yeah i was curious about that too and like you said there's a lot of growth that occurs in college that you can't really predict in high school you know and and everybody a lot of a lot of males in particular, they're not done with their growth spurt until they, you know, get through their sophomore year, maybe. Yeah. Um, sure. So you talked about the Florida State Series. Um, you know, you've continued to hit well since then, but you had a big showing at Georgia where you launched two home runs. You just took, you destroyed them. <laughs> um, going to those at bats, you know, what did it feel like to put on a show like that? Oh, it felt – it was awesome. It was probably something I'll remember forever. Uh, I grew up a Georgia fan. Okay. My, yeah, my mom actually went there. So oh, I've always, wow. I've always been a Bulldogs fan growing up. Like, I've always watched football. So, going there was really cool for me. And just to uh, put on a really good performance like that was a lot of fun. Uh, I know the, I got – it was exciting. When Coach said that they were throwing three left-handed pitchers, I knew I was, like – I was pretty excited just because – as a right-handed hitter, I tend to hit left-handers a little bit better. So I was excited when I heard that. And I know uh, they gave me a couple of good pitches to hit and I put good swings on them. 
yeah, that you get to see the curveball a little bit better, just any pitch a little bit better um, when you're a righty, you know, going against the lefty. In most cases, obviously, there's some u- unique things there. Uh, speaking about your approach as well, why no batting gloves? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just something I've always done for a while now. I uh, I started, pro- I can't even tell you the first time I started doing it. It was sometime in high school because I know my freshman year of high school, I'm pretty sure I wore batting gloves. So. <laughs> Sometime in that period, I stopped wearing them, and I never, I never started wearing them again. So my hands are pretty, they're pretty robust at this point, pretty calloused up. So I know I'm not too worried about getting blisters or anything. They're kind of past the, uh, past the need for them. The blistering phase, yeah. I mean, and you get used to it, and uh, you know, some some players say they have a better feel of the bat. You know, you're you literally feel more connected with the bat that you're using, you know, and aware of what you're doing, you know, because there isn't that barrier between you and the handle. Um, What, uh, you know, you guys came off of beating Stetson. You've had a couple of big wins this year uh, against, you know, power five teams, ranked teams. Uh, When you guys have been playing well, what's been the key for you guys this year? Uh, It's really just getting out of our own way. Honestly, like when we come out and we play our game, we play free, we play, we play loose, we play easy. We really, we really are a dangerous team. So it's exciting that when we just play our game, how, just how capable we are of being that team. So I guess it's just the point when we can realize that's not us on a good day. That's just us. Then I think we'll really take that next step. And hopefully we do that coming out through the rest of the season. (laughs) Yeah. So we have about 15, maybe a little bit more than that left to go, depending on how schedules, you know, move around with COVID. And speaking of COVID, what has it been like uh, being a student athlete during this, you know, COVID altered year? Uh, it's, re- it's really odd, honestly, because I come home and I'm basically stuck in my room for the rest of the day. So mm-hmm. it's really just thinking of ways that I can improve myself. Uh, I started reading a lot more, just trying to trying to do stuff that mm-hmm. I can just benefit from. So instead of just sitting in here maybe watch a Netflix for a few hours. I'll try to maybe get a stretch in, read a book, do something that either I can learn from or help me physically. So it's really just trying, trying not to get acclimated to just sitting on the couch, watching TV, just finding ways to make myself better. Sure. Uh, you know, what is, what, what is something that you like to do away from the field? Obviously being an engineering major you you, there, you enjoy the cerebral side of things is there any you know thing you do hobby wise that you would you know people might not expect um recently i've started walking across the street there's a pond over there so i've been fishing a little bit but i haven't i probably haven't fished since i was in middle school high school much okay. so kind of rediscovering that hobby basically just rediscovering some of the stuff i used to enjoy a lot so that's been my new little hobby, I guess. <laughs> Fair enough. Is there a, uh, you know, if you t- we talked about reading Ted Williams, uh, Science of Hitting, uh, my personal favorite's Ball Four. Is there a favorite, you know, baseball book or piece of literature out there that you kind of go to? Um, baseball books I've read. I read uh, The MVP Machine. That was a good one. And then I read a, literally, it's called The Book. And it's just about the percentages in baseball. So how often you should bunt, how often you should throw an O2 pitch over the plate, stuff like that. And stuff like that really makes me think and really, I guess, just develops some outside thinking and how far or and how I'm thinking about the game. So just some interesting stuff. <laughs> yeah, it does sound in line with sabermetrics, money ball, that whole kind of boom that occurred in the late 90s early 2000s obviously bill james got into it a little bit earlier than that but that stuff is fascinating and you wonder how far it's going to go i mean you see you see so many different things and breakdowns on twitter every single day um and just when we thought 10 years ago that was the cap of it here we are in 2021 and oh, I know. it's it's never ending it's 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 almost a blessing and a curse when it comes to baseball because that's the last thing you want to do is overthink you know so. yeah sometimes <laughs> it goes a little too far so <laughs> yeah we'll see. hopefully there's some ways to combat it and then hopefully it brings us some new ways to think about it so hopefully we'll see what direction it takes us in because I have, I have no idea <laughs> yeah i mean and there's new opportunities with technology obviously the rap soda that you guys use and you know different ways to to get the the uh the information behind the game through technology and there'll be new jobs every year because of that you know and that's the evolution of baseball um 
speaking of obviously we talked about wanting to pursue call uh baseball after college and pursue a professional career if you were to look at yourself academically and then in a you know academic based career what would you know that perfect job be well it's actually the job you were just describing uh so a lot of the new analyst jobs that are coming out of uh, the data inflow to baseball those are the kind of jobs that i'm kind of interested in if i don't go just a straight up engineering job so that's really something that i've had my eyes on maybe maybe it's something i could look at doing down the road so would that look at in terms of you know designing products or would it be more of uh, software engineering um i wouldn't say it would be in that line i'd say it'd be more of I would, I would be hoping to use a little bit more of just my baseball knowledge as a player. So maybe just somebody who understands the game, but can also interpret what the uh, um, people who like create the technology are saying. So mm-hmm. basically like almost like a translator. <laughs> yeah. You're the middleman between yeah. <laughs> the everyday baseball player and then the, you, the, 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 the designer of that product or that method of recording information, because that's definitely a valuable thing. I mean, you look at even seven, eight years ago. Um, and before that, I mean, the amount of, of time and effort that goes into pitch charting, even at low levels of minor league baseball and the data that's created from that. And, you know, I haven't witnessed what's used day to day since then, but I would imagine they're, is a lot to do with what you just discussed. Oh yeah. Um, is there anything specific that you've explored or, um, you know, targeted? Um, I would just say, I mean, I've, I went out of my way during quarantine to learn a couple of the uh, popular computer programs that they use like R and Python and SQL. So just stuff like that, just trying to stay on top of it, stay ahead of the game, but I really haven't dove into a ton of specifics with it. And I think that's something I could do in the future. Yeah, Python's one that you see, yeah. not just in baseball. I mean, that's a universal thing outside of sports as well. Um, well, it's very interesting. I mean, it's it's a it's a growing field, and um, I always am fascinated by it. Yeah, you you know, we're in the middle of the season right now. Um, still, a lot of work to do. Any particular goals that you're really trying to, you know, target for the rest of the year? Um, not really. I'd say just as far as team performance goes, like really, really want to make a run in conference, really want to win the conference. So that's my number one goal. Well, it's uh, definitely possible. You guys are, you know, right in the thick of it in the South and, uh, you know, about half the season left to go in the South. I'll be excited to see how you guys finish up. Uh, it was great talking to you today, Alex, anything you want to leave with? Uh, no, thank you for having me. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Talent Talk. Find the complete archive along with feature articles on unfospreys.com by going to fans and Talent Talk podcast series under the multimedia tab.